Throughout the sleepy little town, as the hour struck ten at night, the windows and doors of every house were closed tightly and locked against the darkness. No cars drove up and down the street. No rowdy kids painted the local bandstand with graffiti or rode their bikes down the middle of the road or played basketball in their driveways. No bright lights were on in any of the homes, and not even the air seemed to move. And somewhere faintly in the night, through the silence of a collectively drawn breath, the entire town could hear the music begin to play again. I was but a young child, only nine years of age, the first time I heard the music. While my parents battened down the hatches, turned off the lights, and cowered in fear, I was transfixed by the joyful tune trickling through the silent streets. I had never heard anything like it. It brought to mind the bright colors and glorious fun of the sort of carnivals I'd only ever seen on TV. As if in a daze, I moved to open the door to hear the music better, but my father grabbed me by my arm and ripped me back, fingers digging brutally into the tender skin of my arm. His eyes were wild and his hair was a mess. His normally tanned face was pale and covered in a thin shine of sweat. He looked sick. Don't you ever open that door when you hear that music, he hissed loudly, punctuating each word with a sharp little shake. Not ever! Neither of my parents had ever laid their hands on me in such a way before this, and it hurt. Sniffling now, with tears standing in my eyes, I rubbed my arm and whined, But why, Daddy? It's so pretty. I just wanted to hear it better. My parents exchanged a frightened glance, then my father dropped to his knees on the floor in front of me. They weren't very old yet, still only in their thirties, but tonight they both looked haggard and worn down, and their faces were drawn and tight with worry. Celeste, I'm sorry I hurt you. I didn't mean to. But you need to listen to me now, my father said gravely, faded brown eyes locked on mine. If you go outside, if you give in and follow the music, you'll disappear and we'll never see you again. What you hear isn't what you think it is, he continued on. It's not a carnival or a circus. It's a parade. But it's not a nice parade with all the happy music and bright colors like the one we watch every New Year's. It's a parade of the dead. He paused and then my mother chimed in, her voice strung with fright and threaded through with attempted composure so as not to frighten me. It first came to this town about, about thirty years ago or so, she said hesitantly, as if searching the recesses of her mind for a long-forgotten and mostly buried memory. Your father and I, we were just children then. We and all of our friends had heard of a special and rare nighttime parade coming to town, and of course we were all very excited. So when we heard the music, we all ran out to see the wonder of it. And it was bright and colorful then with cheerful music and large, beautiful floats. It was all so wonderful. There were stilt walkers and fire twirlers, lions and tigers and cheetahs on leashes, beautiful, colorful costumes, even a big circus elephant. But then among the ones who were walking alongside the floats, your father and I saw our friend Jimmy Kerrigan. He had drowned in the local swimming hole earlier that summer, and we had all been at his funeral. We thought maybe it was just a trick, because no one else had said anything. But then we saw your grandmother, and farther along, my Uncle Daniel. They had passed away a few years before that of pneumonia and cancer. All of a sudden, that's all we could see was dead people. More and more those that we had known well. And what's worse, only a few of us seemed to see it for what it really was. My father, who had been listening intently and nodding in agreement with my mother's words, now chimed in again, eyes not quite as wild but now edged with a slight desperation. Comes once a year, usually in the fall, only at night time, and stays for a whole week every time it comes. That first year it came, at the end of the week, after it had already moved on, some of our parents went missing. Gone, no trace. Some kids that they said looked like our friends were seen traveling with the parade in other parts of the state, but by the time the police went to investigate, the parade had already carried on again and the police lost the trail. The next year, the parade came again, my mother said, her voice lower now and fighting back tears. And as we watched it, sure enough, all of our friends that were missing were there walking in the parade. 
We called to them, but they didn't see us or hear us, and just kept right on walking. And again that fall, more of the local kids went missing, only to turn up in the parade the following year. It only takes children, my father jumped in. We haven't been able to figure out the pattern of which ones it will take, or why. But every year without fail for thirty years now, the parade comes again, bigger every time. And more kids disappear after it leaves. He took a deep breath and rested both of his big hands gently on my shoulders then. I just don't want it to take you too. Promise us, my mother burst in sharply. She knee walked across the floor and took me by both my hands, giving me just a tiny but very urgent shake. Promise us you will never go near that damn parade. Promise, Celeste. I, I promise, I cried out, then burst into tears and threw myself into my parents' arms. The rest of the night was spent sobbing as silently as I could, while the now fear and music played on joyfully and continuously outside. And when I finally did fall asleep, my dreams were plagued with visions of nightmarish entities marching to come collect my soul. The following morning, I woke up to the sun shining brightly on my face. Hurriedly, I ran to the bathroom to brush my teeth and splash some water on my face, my nightmare still vividly fresh in my mind. I ran downstairs to see my father already at his place at the table with his coffee mug already in front of him. He looked up when I came into the kitchen, and once again I was surprised by how old he looked. Good morning, kiddo, he said tiredly, mustering a small smile for me. Good morning, Daddy. Did you and Mommy just wake up too? He just chuckled. His eyes were very red, like they were full of blood. My mother turned around from the stove, and I was even more startled to see that where last night her hair had been the same golden color I'd always known. This morning, there was a wide streak of snow white in her hair. She too looked very tired, but she managed to smile as I slid into my seat and tried my hardest not to stare at her, or I would definitely cry again. And they already looked, well, dead. I had a lot of bad dreams last night, I announced. I kept seeing the parade, and it was coming after me. My mother froze briefly before quickly shoveling eggs from the pan onto my plate, and my father's eyes caught mine. Then he cleared his throat and put down his fork. Celeste, your mother and I didn't sleep last night, he said softly. We stayed up all night trying to keep you from sleepwalking out the door to see the parade. We must have put you back to bed at least twenty times before you finally stayed down. I felt very small as I realized my parents were so tired because of me. I'm sorry, I whispered. I didn't mean to keep you up. My mother and father just smiled and hugged me tightly, telling me it was okay. I didn't feel hungry anymore, so I asked if I could go play in our backyard. My mother just nodded her head, so I stood up and walked out the back door, being careful not to let it slam behind me. Our yard's quite large, with plenty enough toys and contraptions to keep a kid content. My swing set was down near the end of our yard, set back just far enough from the edge of the grass up to where it met a curb on and another road. I would sit here often and just swing back and forth and watch life move past on that road. I sat myself on the swing facing the road and pumped my legs a few times to get started. I swung happily back and forth and watched the road, but nothing came. So I closed my eyes and gripped on tight to the chains and just swung. After a few minutes, I slowed down and opened my eyes, and when I did, I saw the most amazing thing. There was a very tall man in a bright, colorful clothing with huge, long legs standing there on the road, and he was waving at me. I walked up to him, and he smiled down at me. He was painted like a clown with curly blue hair and a huge red smile. I had to shield my eyes from the sun as I looked up at him. Hi there, young lady, he said cheerfully. And what's your name? I'm Celeste. Pleased to meet you. Well then, you're Celeste, and I'm Ralphie. He bent down a bit. Say, would you mind if I took a rest here for a minute? It makes me tired trying to keep my balance while walking on these things, and the parade just keeps on going, like the Energizer Bunny. He barked out a short, friendly laugh, then popped the stilts off of his legs and set them down on the ground next to him. And through all this, I studied his features carefully certainly didn't look like the creatures of my nightmares. He was stocky, with bright blue eyes and a full head and face of flaming red hair. His cheeks were flushed with good cheer, and his warm smile filled with plenty of nice white teeth, 
was captivating and inviting. I began for the first time to question whether my parents were telling me the truth, so I decided to ask. Mr. You can call me Ralphie. Okay, Ralphie. My mom and dad told me that the parade takes kids away and keeps them. I squinted down at him where he still sat on the grass. Is that true? Ralphie gaped at me for a moment. Mouth hung frozen wide open, then let out a huge belly laugh. Then he quit laughing, but not smiling. <laughs> Listen, Celeste, he said cheerfully. Yes, we do take kids. We take unhappy kids that are bored and offer them the chance to work for us and march with us. But we always make sure that the parents give us the big old okay first. And they always do. He winked at me then. Just a quick drop and raise of the eyelid but it sent a little chill down my spine for reasons yet unknown to me. All at once, this man, if that's even what he was, seemed very dangerous, and as I instinctively took a step back, I swore for the briefest moments, and even still swear it now, to this very day, that his mouth wasn't filled with straight white teeth, oh no, but razor-sharp needles meant to tear skin and bone much too easily. Trying not to shudder, I backed up a few steps. Ralphie had clearly noticed my discomfort because his eyes darkened, the smile disappeared right off his face, and he stood up quickly and bent over to pick up his stilts. When he pulled back up, his face was flushed and angry brick red, and his eyes were stormy and black. He raised a finger, now tipped with a very sharp nail, and pointed it at me, flashing the very mouthful of needle teeth I thought I'd seen. You understand nothing, he bellowed. You know nothing. He paused for a moment before he spoke again. You may go now, little one, he rasped. But you are ours. You belong to the Black Parade. And I will come back for you when the Ringmaster decides it's your time. The Parade will march through again, and you will be a part of it forever. Not even bothering to wait for a response, he turned and stormed on up the road, stilts clutched tightly in his fist until I could see him no more. Reeling in shock from my encounter with the first of what would soon be many devils, I did the only thing I could think of. Ball my eyes out. So I did just that. I dropped onto the soft grass of my yard and just cried and cried. After what seemed like forever, my sobs had weighed down to mere snot-filled sniffles, and I deemed it time to go back inside. As I plodded up the yard, a million thoughts spun through my mind, and I felt a very adult determination turn my quivering bones into lengths of cold blue steel. Let the Black Parade try to come for me and take me away. I won't go without a fight. <laughs>